I don't have my microphone turned on. God, this is, it's such a bad thing, Kaylee. I know, I know, I know. And I think we're recording this. I don't know if anybody can see it because, you know, you're lagging, blah, blah, blah. It's so stressful. Okay. I wish, tri <laughs> okay. All right, so is it any better now? What can I do? I love that I call you for help. What are we thinking? Okay, it says I've got good everything. She isn't frozen anymore, Carly says. God bless you. Okay, I should have audio now. I forgot to plug it in. Hey, Cohen. Yeah, it's working now. Okay, are we good? All right, good. I'm out of here. All right, so, sorry. Um, I forgot to turn my microphone on. There, look, guys, there are a poop ton of buttons that I'm supposed to be pushing here. And, again, I don't feel confident about anything that I'm doing. So, let me say again, good morning, family. I'm sorry. What I was trying to tell y'all was I was remiss. I was getting on to myself because, oh, thanks, Logan. Um... Because I'm not telling you good morning, family. And in this time, we need to be as consistent as we can be with one another. Um, so, good morning, family. I'm so glad you're here. I see your uh, little names pop up, and I see your little faces in, in my head, and it makes me feel better. So, at any rate, I was talking to a couple of people about, a, uh, about posting our discussion about the first FRQ and I think that that's good and it's gonna work and then they all freaked out and they were like you posted um, rubric information from AP Central and I think I've told you all a little bit about my struggles with anxiety since you know the incident and so I like all of, like my traps and everything started knotting up and I you know things went a little sideways oh somebody is calling me we can't be having that I th why are you calling me oh wait it's yes working. hey what it's working it's, it's oh. working it's perfect okay thank you are you are you gonna stay on the phone with me I can watch it right now, but I was just trying to tell you so you didn't change anything, mess it up. Okay, good. Uh, all right, let's do this. Bye, Logan. Hello. Hello. Yep. <laughs> all right. So, um, so that was Logan. Good. Just, I, I love that you guys are all like, oh God, somebody's got to tell her it's okay. So, um, I'm going to take that down on Friday. I changed the title of it. To like, I don't know, hide on the internet. I don't know. Like, by the time I left, uh, we're not talking about that, Kaylee. Put it on your whiteboard. So, um, I'm going to take it down on Friday. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask my mentor or something. Because it's on the prep part. So, I assume it's all fine. Right? Like, it's fine that we talk about this. I don't know how else I'm supposed to talk to you about how you did on your FRQs if we can't talk about it like this. Because this is how we're talking these days. So, I'm going to do some investigating on my part, and then, um, <laughs> and then we're going to, uh, we're just going to, we're going to find a way to keep on keeping on. So, that's the deal with FRQ. If you haven't done it yet, don't panic. Like, that's why the, all these things are recorded. I want you here with me. I want you chatting with me, because that's me right? Like, I, I want, this is more about me, I feel like, sometimes than you. I want to see your names pop up. I want to have those conversations with you, and um, I need to feel like we're still us in all of this craziness, but if you, if, if it's not working with your schedule, watch it later. Watch it again, um, but on Friday, I'm going to take that down until I find out they're not going to put me in AP jail. Um, <laughs> so, um, so let's on that on that front. We'll go ahead and we'll get started. Twelve dash six is very short. It has a lot of videos, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you that all of these farming 
types, I guess I'll call them types, are all evidently the AP board is still clinging to them, which I think it is. Oh, hi, Maggie Stewart. Oh, your sweet little blonde hair face smiling at me. Does myself good. Um, so, many farmers are reducing soil erosion and understand the first thing that we got to talk about always is the roots, right? So, I want you to think about every time you think about soil erosion, how can I get handle the root situation? So, soil conservation is one of those things where it's not just a, a, like let's plant things and have the roots hold, but they've done some alternative things. I thought this was beautiful. Um, in my head, this is one of those bazillion dollar resorts I'm never going to get to go to where you sit on a mat and you're like, mm, you know, like that's never going to be my life. I feel like I chose to be a teacher. So I'm going to help you guys get smart and rich and you guys can go there and then you can send me pictures on Facebook because I'm on Facebook now. Who knew? Um, so this is called terracing. And it's steeply slow. It's making steeply sloped land into uh, a different, different levels of contour. So you can see the things that jump out at me are clearly the flat parts, right? So they're all holding water. Um, and then notice what's growing up the side. Are I mean, it's some kind of grass. I feel like that's not in Kentucky. Um, so you've got the roots holding on, you've got uh, water on the top. I think all of this looks great. And I love when you look like down the hill, you see all, I mean like look, and then you look up the hill, like that's beautiful. Um, so it retains water for crops, it reduces soil erosion by controlling the runoff. Um, so small villages in Italy have them, I bet. Uh, she says, I bet they're cheap. Well, uh, go to Italy. Uh, oh, don't go to Italy. Oh, no, don't go to Italy <laughs> right now. Let's let them get everything under control before we go to Italy. For sure. <laughs> um, this, when I first saw this, it reminded me of those crop circles that people do to prove that there is alien life out there, um, which is not what these people are doing. This is called contour planting where we're plowing and planting crops in rows across the slope of the land rather than up and down. So the benefit of this is um, you're working with the land, the way that the land is naturally existing. So you would have to incorporate people who know about maps and they know about, uh, you know, think about those three image, 3D maps. Uh, I, I know you guys know how like rock solid I am with geography. So you can imagine me mapping out a farm, but this is, in my head, this is what it looks like. So instead of fighting the land and tilling it all out, um, you would, you know, go, go with the curvature that is there, that, you know, God, God of your understanding or the lack thereof put there for you. Um, so each row acts like a small dam to help hold the topsoil by slowing the runoff. Uh, so this is strip cropping, not what you're thinking. So you do um, several strips. You'll see this is uh, <laughs> this is corn, then oats, then hay. Um, so we have uh, uh, just different strips that are doing doing different jobs. So alternating strips of row crop and uh, another crop that completely covers the soil, which is our crop cover. I, and I talked to you guys about this. I feel like we talked about this in person and I think this looks cool. It's called alley cropping. So one or more crops, usually the legumes, are planted in the alleys between orchard trees. So the legumes are gonna provide the uh, nitrogen and then the orchard tree provides shade. This is reducing water loss. This is also, um, think about the what we talked about with the pesticides, the herbicides. A lot is coming into play here with alley cropping. So if you were asked to talk about alley cropping, that would be a good one. Okay, conservation tillage farming. So I can tell you, I can remember my little nanny and she would, there was this, okay, there's this thing called a tiller. I think it's called a tiller. And 
<laughs> okay. And you hold on, and I mean, it would just jar the life out of Nanny. She would, it has these big teeth, and it's like, it's like eating the dirt, and, um, it, and when she would take off with it, it would like jerk her forward, and she would, uh, um, and she would never let me do it. I really kind of wanted to do it, but I, it might have ripped my poor little chubby arms right off my poor little chubby body. Um, but I'm going to tell you that th a, a lot of environmentalists will tell you that tilling is the devil and that, you know, we want to get away from tilling the land, that it, it increases, think about wind erosion, right? So you till it up and it gets up in the air and all that stuff. Um, I, but I can tell you, I don't know anything about, I don't know any farmer that doesn't till up the land. So, I don't know, it could be ignorance. So, conservation tillage. It's eliminate or, or minimize the plowing and tilling of topsoil, and you just leave the crop residues on the ground so that they, they just naturally rot there. Um, so, things that I, Stephanie Skimmy Horn, worry about <laughs> is um, like mold, right? Like, if you've got all of this rot, just sitting there, I would worry about like like those th that situation as well. So, let's watch this video. I can't remember. <laughs> oh, see. Trevor. What do you think strip till is? Not sure about that. Sounds like something that would be done to like a a crop or a plant, maybe. They don't till the whole thing every year. They just do the strips in between. What do you think strip till is? Not sure about that. Sounds like something that would be done to like a, a crop or a plant maybe? They don't till the whole thing every year. They just do the strips in between. For conservation purposes so the soil doesn't erode. Nearly 33% of the world's most fertile soil is lost every year to wind erosion. Torrential rains take away even more. But farmers are finding a way to reduce, even stop it, by changing their tillage. Let's take a look at conservation tillage. Tillage is when a farmer turns the soil over to get rid of weeds before planting. But now, to protect the land, farmers are using conservation tillage. And the way it works is, they need something that holds everything in place. They leave the stalks, the residue, and it kind of works like a hairnet, right? Nothing moves, but it's a permeable cover so the rain can come through. You can tell when a farmer uses strip-till because the corn and soybean stalks are left behind from the previous year's crop. There are a couple of ways to do it. Strip-till has two aspects to it. Zone fertilizer is laying your nutrients right where the plant needs it. Another aspect of strip-till is just doing a small strip, maybe 12 inches wide, your tillage through there to keep your residue still in, in place so you don't have as much erosion, and then planting on top of those strips. The number of Iowa acres with conservation tillage is up 110% in the last 25 years. It's a popular approach because, besides reducing erosion, no-till and strip tilling improves the soil beneath. We've seen a dramatic increase in soil quality. We have soil tests, of course, that show that. And that was the, probably the most... Uh... Okay, Is, is it frozen? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to see if that helps. Did that help? Are you doing it right now? Oh, I just stopped the video. Oh, your face is frozen. <laughs> That's great. I hope it's frozen in, a, in an awesome... I mean, it ain't too bad. It's like kind of half of your face. Like you're kind of looking to your mouth. <laughs> Why is this happening? Okay. It's probably the internet. That's what I would assume. Right? You should like hotspot your phone. Like turn on your hotspot. That it, might help. Yeah, eat my data. Well, I mean... <laughs> right. 
anything for you guys. Why stop at the hundred dollar microphone when I could also exactly. eat my data? <laughs> uh, what if it's what if it re what if it records this conversation? Okay, am I back up? I'm looking like I'm back up. Yeah, I think it's working now. Oh my gosh, my computer's spamming. Okay, so are we back up? We're yeah, good? I think so. All right, good. Okay, so I don't know. I feel like it's the internet. I called Kaylee. I don't know if y'all can hear those conversations or not. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to stop showing you guys the videos. Maybe that's a Oh, my God, we've got to watch this. So this is the guy that is in your textbook. I'm going to try again. Um, so this is hydroponics. And I know that a lot of people that, uh, you know, do the home marijuana thing are using this. But he is holding a fish, y'all. This is so cool. I hope it, I hope it goes. Uh, there's something uh, I want to tell you guys <clears throat> that's really important is that Milwaukee is the greatest uh, there's something uh, I want to tell you guys <clears throat> that's really important is that Milwaukee is the greatest city in, in America <laughs> if you guys didn't know that that may get a laugh, but Milwaukee is attracting attention and visitors from near and far. I'm from Wyoming. From Los Angeles, California. Homer, Alaska. I'm coming from Europe, Eastern Europe. I'm living in Latvia. Okay, come on in, you guys. They've come to learn about farming, urban farming. From Will Allen, a pioneer of the local food movement and a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award. It's been a long, surprising journey for Allen. My parents both were involved in sharecropping and we grew up on a small farm. And that's how I learned how to, a lot of the stuff that I'm passing on to others today. Alan may have learned a lot, but he grew tired of farm chores. When I left the farm at 18, I said, never again will I do this hard work. As a six foot six teenager, he thought basketball would be his ticket out of farm life. I don't know if you all can reach up here and grab some, but if you can, <laughs> we'll let you uh, take some home. So when I went away to college, decided to go to University of Miami. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, just don't pay them. There you go, Kaylee. Um, so I won't show you the videos anymore. Yes, this is the place from the core case study. Yes. I'm watching me. Yes. So, um, I'm just waiting on you guys to tell me we're back up. Short shorts. Gosh. Frozen. Give it a couple of seconds. I'm good. Okay, good. Um, so, yes, this is the guy from your court case study. He is so cool, and he saw a need in his environment, in his community, to, uh, to step in and help. So basically, like we were talking about with those food deserts, um, it's just kind of one of these complex problems. So, you know, I'm a big pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of girl. You know, if you want a farm, build a farm. Uh, quit waiting. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. 
So this guy saw a need and he wanted to be able to provide his community with fresh crops and he's, so he's using the fish, right? The hydroponics, he's using the fish uh, and their nitrogen. So think about biogeochemical cycling here, water cycle. I mean, so much is going on here with this guy. It is amazing. And you know, I feel like, I mean, I'm sure he's a special guy, but I feel like he's not doing anything super special. We could do this here in Owensboro. They could do this in Chicago. They could do this in you know, wherever if, if we absolutely had to. Oh, look at the poo. So the best option is soil conversion, uh, conservation, sorry. Understand when you're being tested, who's writing the test, who are you writing to, right? So, you know, it may not be the time to like declare, you know, this, I'm going down with the farmers. Although if you're gonna go down, go, with the, go down with farmers. Um, so the next best is to restore some of the lost plant nutrients. Organic fertilizer, which is, um, yes. I'm reading the comments and I'm not understanding. So, I, we're not gonna talk about what just made my blood boil a little bit. Okay. Um, so, for organic fertilizer, animal manure, green manure, compost, uh, there is this, so I'm gonna look to do it maybe next year, which I know won't help you guys at all. But there, I was on Facebook, because that's where I am these days, and there was a lady and she gives each child 20 worms in a, a plastic shoe box and they compost with their worms. And it seems very cool and they're all, and they're all, um, worried about their worms at this time like to keep them alive for the whole year um, so I know there are rules with composting and what you can put in and what you can't put in so don't just start throwing a bunch of stuff out there um, I saw Hank one time you know he's the dead chihuahua and he was walking <laughs> across the like the backyard somebody had thrown out a whole burrito in the wrapper and like it was bigger than his head and he was so proud that I mean I don't know did my chihuahua like take a burrito from somebody when they weren't looking and like and if a, a chihuahua takes your whole burrito from you do you deserve said burrito I don't know but like I don't know that you should put the whole like I don't know that you should put a whole burrito in your compost pile um so Luke wants to know what's green manure. <laughs> and I have a lot of smart aleck things to say about that. Um, but I'm, so <laughs> when we look at green manure, we're looking at those, those um, I'm gonna say those healthy compost, right? Not just anything. Yes, plant waste, yes. So synthetic inorganic fertilizer may also be used and again anytime we see synthetic we think oh that's got to be bad and anytime we see organic we think oh that's got to be bad but it doesn't it's not always bad guys so they don't replace the organic matter although they come in pretty handy to completely restore nutrients to topsoils both inorganic and organic fertilizers must be used so every time that we see inorganic i know We've kind of been trained through this journey to be like, oh, it's got to be bad, but no, so it's okay. Um, we can produce meat and dairy products more efficiently, so we can look for more sustainable ways to acquire our meats, acquire our fish. Um, this has shifting from less grain efficient forms of animal protein, such as beef, pork, and carnivorous fish, to more grain efficient forms. Poultry, plant, eating fish, like who? Catfish? Ugh. Um, so, many people regularly have one to two meatless days a week. And let me just say, again, um, I think that one to two meatless days a week is totally doable for everyone. But I also have never been a teenage boy that is going through what teenage boys are going through. So I also want to hear 
and recognize that you've got a lot of chicks in your life that are telling you you should do this or that. But as the group fitness gimme horn, I want to say listen to your body, right? You fellas are, I mean, clearly you're all muscle men and you're all working out. You got that cake. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying, Luke? So, um, you know, you, you need to listen to your body. And when you are figuring out what works for you, if that's meat for right now, then that's meat for right now. I uh, also want to throw in there that there's a lot of studies with red meat and cancer. Uh, you guys at this stage in your development aren't really prone to cancer. So you're probably not into that lifestyle. Um, so it's, it's, it's your personal choice. But if you could do meatless days, it, you know, it would help all of us. Um, <laughs> I can't try to be you, Kaylee. I cannot. Well, I don't know. Maybe I was you, Kaylee. I don't know. Um, Caleb says, no meatless days allowed. Caleb, it's got to have. I understand. Um, you know, when you're out and you're running and you're doing stuff, it, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal. So, maybe meatless days in your future. Maybe meatless days now. Big deal. So, our big ideas are... <laughs> I love you, Luke Taylor. I do. I miss you so much. About one billion people have health problems because they either don't get enough to eat or you can look at the 1.6 billion that are struggling because they are eating too much. Um, and again, the yin and the yang, right? So you're either, either way, your, your diet is affecting your overall ability to be a healthy person. Modern industrialized agriculture has greater, greater harmful impact on the environment than any other human activity. Oh, I am so sorry <laughs> that um, they say that because, again, remember the payoffs and how much we love them farmers. And then more sustainable forms of food production will greatly reduce the harmful environmental impacts of industrialized food production systems while likely increasing food security. Understand that um, we, just cr we just chase that almighty do dollar, right? And we're right on the tail end of major industrialized revolutions. And so I feel like literally greener pastures are in our future and we're gonna find a way to to harness that. Okay, so this concludes our chapter 12. And uh, so I'm gonna post your vocab quiz today. Um, so you're gonna take that today. And then I'm going to, <laughs> I'm gonna post your tw uh, chapter 12 unit exam tomorrow. And uh, we're gonna, we're just gonna move forward. I'm gonna make your chapter 12 vocab quiz a homework grade. I'm gonna make your chapter 12 unit exam a quiz grade. And then those of you that haven't done the FRQ and you're gonna, and you, pl you are planning on doing the FRQ, I'm gonna try to do twofold. So I said yesterday I was gonna post your chapter 12, 112, two vocab quiz. I did not. Um, Madness and mayhem ensued here, and so I'm, that's on my list to get to today. And then I'll put your vocab quiz in tomorrow, and your unit 12 exam I will get in maybe Monday. So uh, we're just keep on keeping on. I love that you guys are all talking about your food now. <laughs> um, there you go. Oh, five guys, right? So, um, all right, I'm going to get out of here if I can figure out how. Maybe.